and defying all expectations, Technology Man has safely landed the ship everywhere it belongs. Welcome, everyone, to a special episode of Creative on Purpose Live. In this series of episodes, I am getting together with some of my friends and mentors whose ideas have influenced and inspired some of the ideas in my latest book, The Coaching Business Prescription. I'm here with my friend and mentor, Seth Godin. Welcome, Seth. Great to have you with us. Uh, please tell our viewers that the one viewer that doesn't know who you are, who you are, what you're up to these days, and where can people go to learn more about you and the difference you're making? Okay, so for the other viewers who do know who I am, I will take my allotted time to say the following. Watching a video about your book is not the same as reading your book. And if it's worth your time to watch this conversation, it's worth your time to go click the link and buy the book right now. Because the idea that we can get an idea, just one, from spending a few minutes at our own pace working our way through a book is priceless. Don't hesitate. Just go do that. Thank you very much, Seth. I appreciate that. Well, the idea that I, there's there's kind of three ideas. Two, I attribute directly to you. And one um, is someone else's, but I learn from you. And they're all around this idea of going small, which uh, is counterintuitive and uh, definitely in defiance of all the gurus who are, you know, the sultans and sultanesses of scale. Um, and the, the primary, so it's talked about in the book, but it changed my life when you, I came across your idea of first 10. And I'll explain how it changed my life, but I'd like for you to first share a little bit about what does, what do you mean when you say get your first 10? Okay, so for context, it wasn't um, as frustrating to live in 1975 because Walter Cronkite wasn't going to put you on the news and you weren't going to get called by CBS to make a television show. So there was this huge gate and there were gatekeepers and you weren't getting through it. So you could go back to doing what you were doing all day. And part of the seduction and indoctrination of social media was everybody has a camera. Everyone has a keyboard. The only thing that's keeping you from being famous to everyone is your own laziness. And that help people fall in love with the path of being a Kardashian. And the problem, there are two problems with being a Kardashian. Number one, we didn't even need one Kardashian. And problem number two is we already have one now. So we don't need a second one. It feels like if you have an infinite number of followers and attention being paid, it doesn't matter if only a tiny percentage care about you. That's still a big number. So first 10 is a response to that. It's a response to people who say, well, I have to spam everyone. I got to get the word out. Well, actually, no. What you need to do is tell 10 people, 10 people who already trust you, who already know you, who are already in the group that needs the work you're doing. If you tell that your idea, if you share it with 10 people, write your novel, just give it to 10 people. If they spread the word, ask for more, tell the others, you got it right. If they didn't, you either have to make better work or find different sorts of people. But taking your probably mediocre work to ever more people isn't the solution. And you know the evidence is really clear. The average video on YouTube is going to be seen fewer than five times today, probably zero. That's the average. I love it. So we've got some uh, names that you'll recognize from a purplish space that you and I frequent um, that are liking the conversation already. And yeah, so the, when when I, I I think it was in the marketing seminar that first ten might have come up come about. Maybe it was in the Alt MBA, but the thing that it, that flipped the switch for me was uh, because we're all programmed by nature and evolution to chase more. And we are also, um, and it's a seductive way of hiding. Like it, it, if we just keep chasing more, it prevents us from doing the better work that is necessary to get actually more of the right people. But this idea that all you need is 10 to get started is how I wrote my first book. Um, there's a, a story b between Seth and I there that I, I won't bore you with now. I've talked about it many times, um, but the very poorly named Stoic Creative was put out 
on a Amazon sales page and 10 people said that they would buy it before I even wrote it. And that put me on the hook to write the book and the book was written. And then of course, a few more books were sold after that. So just that idea that you could validate an offer, an idea, a creative endeavor by just getting 10 people to raise your hand and say, yes, I would follow you on this journey was really, really powerful. And then there was this other idea that uh, you unpacked definitely in the marketing seminar uh, which is the idea, and it's associated, I think, with First 10, but the idea of the smallest viable market. And when you talk about that, Seth, what specifically are you talking about it? And why is it the better approach than the, the scale approach of most of the gurus? Okay, so I want to just put a pin in a couple of things. The first one is this idea of getting, of being small as opposed to seeking scale. I almost never embrace the word small when I have the ability to use the word specific instead. <clears throat> the problem with trying to be big is you have to be general and you have to be average. The, the scary thing about the smallest viable audience is you have to be specific. If you can only pick 200 people that you're going to amaze, that you're going to create something remarkable for, if you're going to name them, you're on the hook now because you got to pack the house with the best people. If it doesn't change their life, that's about your work now. Whereas if it's a big, big crowd, you can say, well, it's on them. No, it's on me because I picked this viable audience. And what it frees us to do is not only are we on the hook, but we don't have to constantly dumb it down, speak in uh, complete sentences and leave out the you know, the jargon, we can say for the people like us who get where we are going, this is what we are doing. This is what things are like around here. It brings enrollment with it. And that shift is critical because it lets you do your work. And there's all this pressure to average it out and dumb it down and make it more convenient. But the people who succumb to that pressure almost always fail. Someone's going to succeed, mm -hmm. but it's probably not going to be you. So I love that. And I appreciate the, the, the pointing out of the specificity. If there are a hundred people, they know you and you know them and everyone's on the hook. Uh, everyone knows when someone is missing from the room. Uh, and, but I think the other thing is it becomes sort of a leverage point of force amplifier for um, taking, at, at least in my experience, I tend to be uh, I, I had the thing that I want to do and I had the thing I want to create and I want to create that thing and then I want to give it to you. And instead, when this, this dynamic that you are suggesting, it's like, well, instead of starting with what I want and what I want to do, why don't I turn my attention to you? What do you need? What, where do you want to go? Where are you right now? And how do I help engineer or how, how do I help, um, us co-create a path that will help you get from where you want to where you want to be that leverages my skills. Except you got to, you left out the key step. You get to pick the audience. So if you show up uh, at a, a accountable convention and <laughs> ask people what they want for lunch, that was your choice to show up at the cannibal convention. So you don't get to complain afterwards about what, that, that no one was a vegan, right? That when you get to pick, the people you are choosing your future. Choose your customers, choose your future. Yeah, I remember that. It's a line that's really stuck with me. And 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 yet, so these ideas are just true because they are self-evident. I mean, I think that the the, the, the practicality of, of these things that you have taught us um, is just undeniable. And yet, we frequently find ourselves falling back into old habits and getting, being complicit and getting in our own way and, and putting up unnecessary obstacles or, or limits. Um, and I think that speaks to the fear, the resistance, all the things that we, uh, our friend Sonia talks about um, mastering your disguise. So how do we, even if we know these, have these ideas at hand and we believe these ideas, these assertions to be true, how do we keep ourselves on that path um, and not fall prey to the resistance and the fear? 
Well, if I could answer it in 45 seconds, uh, I wouldn't need Steve Pressfield. But uh, <laughs> I guess what I would say is there's, there's other questions that I can put on the table. The first one is this. Do you really care about making a change in the world? Or would you just like to be applauded for trying? If you really care about making a change in the world, you need to announce who are you seeking to change and what change are you seeking to make? If these are generous changes, then you are like a lifeguard who is standing on the dock and someone four feet from you is drowning. Is there somebody more qualified than you to save that person? Of course there is. There are people who did better at their water safety test and everything else, but they are not standing where you are standing. They are not in the space you are in. You are. So if you're serious about being a lifeguard, you better jump in the water and save the person. So if the shift we seek to make is a generous one, if you believe that your jazz quartet is going to make a difference for the people in the audience, well, then you're doing it with and for them. You're not doing it just so you can buy yourself grilled cheese sandwiches. And as a result, you need to get on stage because if you don't, those people aren't going to get what they need. And that shift from introspection to generosity has always been a powerful force for me. When I started, I was trying to pay the bills. And the harder I was trying to pay the bills, the worse I did. And when I was able to shift and say, I picked you as my customer because I think I have something you need, things got much better. Yeah, well, and it speaks to the, you know, so sometimes I think we we ignore the advice to take the specific approach and take small steps into our potential and, and possibility um, because then we build in deniability if we don't achieve. I mean, that's one of the biggest dangers, I think, of defining success is once you've defined what success me looks like for you, you've just defined the infinite number of ways failure looks like to you. And it's, uh, and it, it can be very fraught, which speaks to something else that you talk quite a bit. But about. Hold on to that thing. Oh, hold sure. on to your question, because first I'm thrilled that folks are here engaging with this. And I know it's easy to feel insufficient in the face of all of the leverage and choice that we're describing here, because no one can say no if you get rid of the gatekeepers. I'm not name dropping here because I'm not going to drop the name. But last week, one of the most famous people in the world came to see me for coffee with his producer. And I just described to them for 20 minutes what you and I talked about. The thing he did that made him famous happened 49 years ago. And you could just see she understood it. And he refused to acknowledge that any of this mattered. He just wanted to know where does he find the publisher for his autobiography and where does he find the producer for his Broadway show? And I'm like, there isn't a publisher who's going to take your autobiography and there isn't a, a producer who's going to take your Broadway show. What you're going to need to do is find 50 people where you can do your work that will change their life so much that they will find you 50 more people. And you have to do that again and again. I know you've earned the right to not want to do that. I know you've paid your dues. I know that the next thing should be like that first thing was. It's not going to happen. So if it's that's the position he's in, don't be surprised if that's the position you're in. Right. And it's that the, the, the receptivity, like how to, keeping the open loop, you know, we are, we are designed to close the loop. We want to Google the answer. We want, we want the roadmap. We want the system. We want the formula, the secret uh, key, whatever it is. And it, it, we refuse to, we're not programmed to leave that loop open. And, and I think we also fail to recognize how important relationships, the relationships, the people we surround ourselves with. Um, you talk a lot about affiliation and I think affiliation is built into some of these ideas like first 10 and smallest viable market. Um, how, how, what are some, what's some pragmatic advice you would have for helping people be a little bit more discerning and uh, discriminating in the proper sense of the word about who they, who they spend their time and attention with. You know, something I've noticed about freelancers, and I'm uh, going around a circle here, but some of the things I've noticed about freelancers is if you ask a freelancer, how often do they hire freelancers? 
and do they pay them well? The answer is, well, I can't possibly do that because I'm struggling, blah, blah, blah. And so we have this mindset as we struggle that the customer is someone else, some philanthropy-minded person who's going to pick us and give us the runway to get to where we're trying to go. And if you hang out with other freelancers who act and think the same thing, you're just going to reinforce that. So part of it is, how do we find ourselves in the room? And that's usually by inventing the room where the people we seek to be next to are next to us. And I've told the story of Tom, uh, when I was at building one of the very first internet companies, AOL was our biggest customer. And they had a conference and they invited their 100 biggest vendors to come. And Tom took a suite with money he probably didn't have. And he invited eight of us to come hang out that evening. And we all shared our contracts and we all shared everything we knew and we didn't hold anything back. And being in the room with those seven other people, all of whom were struggling, but all of whom knew something that the other eight, seven people didn't know. Creating that peer circle, that was priceless. And one of the reasons Silicon Valley works is not because there's a geographic reason for it to exist anymore. It's because the other people are right there at Trader Joe's. They're right there at the gym. And you can organize that. You can figure out who do I need to be around? Who's going to push me into a discomfort so I can level my game? And you're speaking to something that I think um, we often don't pay enough attention to, which is when we look at what we are able to control in our life, what we actually possess agency over, it ain't much. You know, the outside, you know, other people, situations, events, there's many forces that can conspire um, in our favor or disfavor. But there's a couple things that we do possess agency over that we don't always um, that we don't always step into and stay in, which is we we actually possess the ability to decide how we see things, how we frame them, and what we choose to do and then do next. And okay, folks. That is what stoicism actually is. So why don't you <laughs> why don't you say it again slowly because people miss this every time. Yeah. So uh, there there there's almost nothing within your control, but yet you control the two things necessary to live a joyful, flourishing life. You possess control over your perception, the way that you choose to see things, and you have control. Uh, control over and authority over your decisions and actions, what you choose to do and do next. And if you marry that to what Seth has been saying about taking, um, being specific about who you are spending your time with and who you are doing your work with and for, and you take micro small steps into possibility every single day through a daily discipline, a practice of your craft, you will make progress. Um, and you will make progress at a pace that probably doesn't scare you back into being uh, stuck because you are earning confidence and a little bit of courage as you have every little uh, make make every little step. So, Seth, if you don't mind, we're going to fly through. But I, I not. Oh, I'm sorry, I've been talking too much. Go for it. No, no, no. This is, I just wanted to say so. Um, Mariana is uh, here with two of her favorite people. I'm sure they're both. Where are they? <laughs> uh sonia david shout out to sonia whose book uh master your disguise just went out today she was featured on my blog today so check that out um yes answering the question what do you make uh there's i'm going to skip across a couple here um it sounds like holding on to the humility of each of our being one in eight billion. I love that. Actually, I, I wouldn't mind hearing you speak to that a little bit as well, Seth. I think there's, we're always kind of toggling, you know, we're, as human beings, we are, are always very interested in our personal significance. Um, and we are always um, aware of our cosmic insignificance at the same <laughs> time. How do we, how do we balance or not balance, but how do we find harmony with those two ideas? <sighs> harmony is different than consistency, right? Harmony is about two things that don't match, that fit together well enough that we can make music with them. We can't help but be witness to what's in our field of vision. 
there are people on other planets, not people, uh, species on other planets. We have no idea if they're suffering. We have no idea if they just had a flood. But we can see with our own eyes what happened to our neighbors or to our friends in Hawaii or somewhere else. And it's very easy in those moments to feel powerless, to feel bereft. If it causes you to take action that makes those people's lives better, then that's worth it. If it doesn't, if it's just part of your narrative of endless doom and gloom, well, then what's it all for? What we have is a very limited period of time to make a difference for other people. And what Western culture has indoctrinated us into doing is beating the others and acquiring a bigger pile of stuff by trading our time and our, our joy for it. And I think a whole generation of people is waking up and saying, we're tired of the caste system and we're tired of the status game and we're tired of the accumulation. What can we do instead to make things better? Yeah. Quick uh, final shout out to Sonia, who is grateful for the shout out. Uh, there's a name that will be familiar to Seth. Uh, we have um, I'm, I'm in, I, I hope I'm saying that right. And then uh, Tom Trainer, always too kind, Tom. We appreciate you. And of course, there's another name you might recognize, Seth. There's Penny. Um, so you spoke to this idea of making a difference. Do, and doing work that matters is probably that phrase alone is what drew me into the Alt MBA back in August of 2016. This idea, and because I think if we can just nudge on over to a topic uh, or, or to your book, um, we are creatures that are in search of significance. One of the, the perennial books of all time is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. We are meaning seeking creatures. Um, and one of the ways that we can do this is doing work that matters, making a difference to use some of your terminology. And I'd like to just piggyback onto that, this idea, this, this idea from ancient spiritual and philosophical traditions, that there is this difference that only you can make, your life's calling, your vocation, the work that you are meant to do. Um, any insights on, you know, if you're, if you're going to do work that matters, how do you find, how do you align that with um, the work that you were meant to do or the gift, the net, the gifts that you have? Well, I learned so much from when I talked to you, but also you're great at driving StreamYard. People can learn a lot from you. And also you're great at setting me up for things that we can actively disagree on. I don't believe anybody has a calling. I think our gifts are limited to things that uh, probably don't line up with vocations and professions. And I think that we let ourselves off the hook when we say, I was born to play the clarinet in a reggae klezmer band. And if I can't do that, I'm giving up. You weren't born to play the clarinet in a reggae klezmer band. You just weren't. These are choices we make based on the cards that are in front of us. Van Gogh was not, would not have been an oil painter if he was born 20 years ago or if he had born, been born 200 years before. Same parents, same DNA. No, that was a situational choice. And if the choices you are making aren't getting you the results you seek, we can rail against the unfairness of the universe because it is unfair. Or we can make different choices. Mm -hmm. And that is at the core of what I've learned from you about stoicism, is stop talking about your calling. You, Who's calling? No one's calling. You have a chance to speak up and offer. Talk about your offering. And if you can make a different offering that's gonna help more people in a better way, please do. And this is super critical. We quit things our whole lives. Very few people who are on this call still wear a tutu and take ballet lessons and very few people on this call are you know doing uh, five cent magic tricks. We did that when we were six years old. We don't do it anymore because we made a choice. And the problem with this buffet that's in front of us of all of these choices is they overwhelm us so we don't make any. And the idea of local leadership, which I think is different than the denigration of leading from the bottom. Bottom of what? It's local. It's local because we get to, to assemble the circle, it can have a huge impact. Alcoholics Anonymous 
started with 12 people. We don't even know who's in charge. It's anonymous. But someone showed up and showed up and showed up and made a change up. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective. I'd like to dig in a little bit more on that because I think this is one of the things that this points to is it's not, we're, we're never really, taught, there are not met many absolute answers. So it's not this way or that way. Many times it's a both and, but that idea, that vocation or purpose, let's talk about that just for a second. Um, again, it's something that can really fuel and drive us and um, give us a sense of fulfillment and meaning and purpose in our lives. Um, and it's something that we can use as a seductive way to hide from our limitless potential and our inner greatness. And one of the things that I have found is that when I stopped thinking about purpose as a destination, something out there on the horizon that I had to go, like I have to go find my purpose and then I'll figure out what to do with my purpose or the other approach, which is to look within and excavate your purpose from inside you and then figure out what to do with it. But instead treating purpose as an emergent, um, uh, emergent thing, um, which I think is speaking a little bit to what you're talking about, which is if I simply bring purpose to the work I'm doing, the work right in front of me, to the conversation I'm in, to the relationships that I'm in, if I, if I bring intention and I bring integrity to the things I'm already doing, purpose, passion, all these things that we're often chasing uh, to, uh, and, and causing, making us suffer because we can't find them and we can't, and we're clinging to these ideas. They disappear. They become emergent properties. And then the journey becomes the reward as opposed to that result or outcome that we've been chasing to no avail. Yeah, I think that's very smart. Here's the thing. If you have a mission or a purpose, show me how it is helping you make difficult decisions. So Johnson & Johnson has a mission statement, but they're lying. That's not really their mission. If it was, they could point to difficult, expensive decisions that they have made based on that. Actually, their purpose is to maximize shareholder value and to please the boss by doing something the boss wants them to do. Those two things fit their narration all day long. And the same thing is true for individuals. We reverse engineer what we say our purpose is based on what we think is going to make our decision easier going forward. So, you know, I've had this really lovely luck-filled uh, career, 35 years or so of being in some sort of media. But when I was in the computer game business in 1982 or three, oh, my purpose was to help science fiction authors bring their work to life in interactive stuff, right? Because I knew these guys, Michael and Ray and things. So I had to make up a story about that was, my, well, I haven't done anything like that in 30 years. So what had happened to my purpose? So when Sonia asks about gifts, if I had been born in a different country or at a different time or with a different skin color or a different appearance, I don't, am certain my life would have been very different. So the, the, my limited attention span, which I think of as a gift, would have doomed me if I worked on a farm in 1941. And so we've got to just decide, we have a bunch of tools. There's a tool chest. Sometimes we have resources we can go and buy new tools with. What are you building? Are you, which marble are you taking away so the statue will be left when you're done? And the arc for me has been 35 years, but I also have three week arcs and we pick our arc. We pick our audience. We pick the change we seek to make that and the story we tell ourselves are up to us. And if you're, if your excuses are helping you go for it. And if they're not, then what are they for? Yeah. Well, it speaks to the, the, uh, you know, another misconception. I think that there is that purpose is a singular thing. Like you're only meant to do one thing and that's probably not true. <laughs> we, you know, we, we are iterative evolving creatures. We go through seasons and, and different phases of our lives. And I, I'm of the conviction that purpose is not singular, that we can purpose can evolve day to day, situation to situation, role to, and uh, goal to role to goal. Um, 
but it's uh, purpose almost becomes for me more of an attitude and a posture, a way of approaching doing whatever it is that you yeah. need to do right, right now. And it becomes a um, uh, renewable or uh, renewal, renewing property. It's just more bringing purpose to what you do begets more purpose. And then you can bring that into your work. So we got off on a, on a great um, tangent there. I appreciate that. This is as, as the founder of creative on purpose, Seth, you know, purpose is a topic near and dear to my heart. I have missed a bunch of the um, people that have been leaving comments here. And I apologize to all of you for that. Um, I'll get to you in the comments, but I want to be respectful of your time, Seth. Again, this idea of first 10, smallest specific viable market. Um, these are ideas that I have found to be profoundly useful in the building of my own business, but, uh, and, and there are things that are taught in the book. And this idea of um, significance that we've been talking about here towards the end is a topic that you cover in your latest book, The Song of Significance. I'm gonna put links to both books in the- um, Say the name of your book slowly and where is the best place to buy it? The best place to buy the coaching business prescription is at amazon.com. Uh, it's the only book by that title. Might have been done on purpose. I don't know. Um, as Seth knows, I don't, not everything I do is on purpose. Seth, I say this at the end of every conversation. Um, your mentorship, your friendship has changed and transformed my life in ways I could never have foreseen and in ways that are miraculous and have really just been of extreme benefit to me and my family. So I want to thank you again for all the differences that you make in, uh, in the world, in the lives of the people, many of them here on the call. And uh, just thank you for being a force for goodness in the world. Well, thank you. I couldn't do it without you, Scott. All right. Go make a ruckus, everybody. We'll see you.